think my older brother read me the Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland chapter and all mm. that. It sounded fascinating. I learned about uh, general relativity initially from, in more detail from Schrodinger's little book, quite ironically, that Schrodinger. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he had a very nice little book called um, Space Time Structure, or something like that, mm -hmm. in which the, all the book is very beautifully written. There's the last chapter where he goes on to his own particular scheme, which um, I'm not so keen on, but, the, but when he's talking about standard general relativity, it's a mm -hmm. very nice book. But then when I went to Cambridge as a graduate student, I went to do pure mathematics, geometry, algebraic geometry, but I s sat in on lectures by Herman Bondi, beautiful course of lectures on general relativity and cosmology, and a course by Dirac, another beautiful course in a completely different way on quantum mechanics, and a course on mathematical logic, which was very good too, by Steen. And these courses, I think, in some ways influenced me more than the courses I <laughs> was supposed to be going to. Although there were some very good ones there too, on topology, on algebra, um, various things which uh, I got a lot out of. My friendship with Dennis Sharma, when I was in Cambridge, he, uh, he befriended me very much. He knew, he knew my brother previously. And uh, we had lots of very uh, good discussions. I learned a lot of physics from him, uh, not just general relativity, but other areas of physics. Felix Pirani was there. I learned a lot of general relativity from him. He certainly expressed the idea of understanding the curvature tensor was important. Um, so, so Bondi and Sharma and, and Pirani and other people, I think, um, but it, it wasn't the case that I necessarily wanted to do it as a career. I think this came about more when I came back to Cambridge as a fellow, research fellow, and Dennis Sharma persuaded me to go to a lecture in London given by David Finkelstein. And he was describing how the, what is, had been commonly known as the Schwarzschild singularity, what we now call the horizon of a black hole, was not actually a singularity and you could extend through it and you had a singularity in the middle but you didn't have this. So I came away I and mean, we had discussions and I got sort of fired up to do more generally. I mean he commented on this that I told him about some of the things I was doing about combinatorial quantum mechanics and he went in that direction and I went to general relativity which had mm. been his direction. But uh, I think I was struck by the fact that even though the this apparent singularity at the horizon was now not there you pushed it somewhere else you still had the singularity in the middle and uh, I wondered whether there wasn't some theorem about the pr uh, persistence of singularities in some sense this was a long time before I proved my own theorem <laughs> many years later using completely different methods. I had no idea about them at the time. But I did wonder, you know, what kind of methods could you possibly prove a thing like that? I had no idea at all, because I knew very little about the subject. But I had been studying spinners, because I'd been interested in quantum mechanics and tensor systems and what are spinners, and it intrigued me a lot. But uh, this was the main thing I knew about, and so I tried to write general relativity in spinners. And it, lots of things came out so beautifully that I got hooked by the subject. I think that was the main thing. I, these things were quite uh, fit together in, in a beautiful way, which I hadn't anticipated at all. And then, uh, then that really hooked me. I think general relativity is, is extremely well established now uh, when, with the cosmological constant, so you seem to have to have that. Uh, but I don't know any, see any reason for changing the theory, at least on the classical scale. There is an issue about what you do in relation to quantum mechanics. And uh, my view on that is a bit different, I think, for many people. People think you should quantize general relativity and this would give you some kind of crazy foam structure or something, who knows what, at the level of, well, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the scale of ordinary particles. So that's, uh, when I say 20 orders of magnitude, that's 10 to the 20, 20 zeros after the one. Um, so, I'm not sure about that. Uh, 
You see, I, my view is that the combination of quantum mechanics with general relativity, which does come, I mean, you need a marriage between those two subjects, but that marriage will not be a quantum gravity in the sense it will not be a quantum theory in the conventional sense of the word of gravity. It will have to be a theory in which the quantum mechanics itself is modified, um, mainly because quantum mechanics is a self-inconsistent theory. I wouldn't want quantum theory to survive at all levels because it can't. That's to say it consists of two parts. One is the evolution of a quantum system, the Schrodinger equation, uni unitary evolution, whatever you like to call it, the way a state evolves in time, which is a deterministic equation. And the second is what happens when you make a measurement. And that's a completely different thing. Your measuring device is supposed to be treated classically according to the standard Copenhagen point of view, which doesn't make sense because it's a quantum system if everything else is too. So why does it suddenly choose one out of the alternatives that are available to it? So there's something missing in the theory itself. And the thing which I think to be is missing is to do with gravity. So there are conflicts between the general principles of quantum mechanics and of general relativity. And resol resolving those conflicts seem to me will involve in a change in quantum mechanics. I mean, general relativity at some sort of level will have to face up to quantum effects. But I think the main problem is with quantum mechanics. So I have used the term in papers of mine sometimes, the gravitization of quantum mechanics. And one can make an estimate at the level that things ought to or to show up where the gravitational effects ought to be relevant. I don't regard gravity as difficult to comprehend in comparison with things in quantum mechanics. You see, gravity, we have this beautiful theory of Einstein's, 100 years old now, which, um, from the mathematical point of view, makes complete sense that you can understand what's going on. It's a differential manifold. It um, has equations which one can write down and understand, and, and they're completely, they make sense. Okay, they're not easy to solve. And if you've got a particular problem you want to solve, it can be extremely difficult. So it's difficult to work with in practice, but it's not so difficult to comprehend. I mean, he uses ideas of mathematics, which you may not have, in physicists, wouldn't have been familiar with previously, which was what made it difficult. Um, you have to understand ideas of differential geometry and curved spaces and higher dimensions and so on. But there's a good calculus which deals with such things. And once you get the hang of it, you can get a feeling for the subject. The trouble with quantum mechanics is it has this um, inconsistency. I mean, you know, people say you can't understand quantum mechanics. Well, that's because, yes, indeed, you can't understand it because it's self-inconsistent. <laughs> It's the, the measurement part of quantum mechanics is not consistent with the evolution part of quantum mechanics. Then after all, you might say measurement is a kind of evolution. What The system is like that, you make a measurement, it's, then it does that. Evolution is from this to that. So you need a scheme which contains that kind of evolution together with the standard uh, linear Schroeder, Schrodinger, or whatever you want to use, whatever description you want to use, the standard unitary evolution of quantum mechanics, is, is well defined, but it doesn't give you the answer. It gives you a superposition of cats which are dead and alive at the same time, and so on. And we know that's not the world we see. That's, that's the world of, of the equations, not the actual world. <laughs>